Welcome to The Baton, a John Williams musical journey. Join host Jeff Cummings as he takes you through the career of the illustrious film composer John Williams, starting with his debut in 1959 through more than 100 films in 60 years. In this episode, we hear the John Williams compositions for How to Steal a Million, made in 1966. And here's your host, Jeff Cummings. Hi, everybody, and welcome back. Or if this is your first episode, welcome. Before you dive into it, if this is your first time, I urge you to go back and listen to previous episodes because this is really a journey through John Williams' career, and you want to be able to get all the context through his career if you start at the beginning and work your way up to this one. We'll be here when you come back. Before I started this podcast, How to Steal a Million was the earliest movie I had seen in John Williams' filmography, and I was excited to revisit it this year. I had first seen How to Steal a Million in the early 2000s on television. I hadn't planned to watch it, but I was hooked when I saw music by Johnny Williams on the screen. This was the first film I had seen where John Williams had called himself Johnny, and I was curious. Was this the same person? After watching the film and loving it, I did some research and discovered this was indeed the John Williams who had written some of the best music of my life. Williams had just finished work on The Rare Breed for Universal Pictures when 20th, 20th Century Fox came calling again for John Williams to put his stamp on another comedy after doing good work on Bachelor Flat. At the time, none of the serious composers who were racking up Academy Awards and getting screen credit on some of the most popular pictures of the time were interested in frothy comedies. It wasn't really about the money as it was about the elitism composers put on comedies. It didn't offer the same kind of challenge as drama films did. Plus, when it came to what really mattered, the Academy Awards rarely took notice of music and comedy films. That didn't matter to John Williams, who was showing everyone that he was a chameleon in terms of his work, a quality that he continues to this day. He wasn't going to turn down a film just because it was a comedy, and the film we're highlighting today was the epitome of a romantic comedy, starring two of the biggest actors on the planet at the time. Who would say no to working on a film starring Audrey Hepburn and Peter O'Toole? Hepburn was a big movie star in 1966, as big as they come. She had won an Oscar for Roman Holiday in her film debut in 1953, became an icon as Holly Golightly in 1961's Breakfast at Tiffany's, and was Eliza Doolittle in the film version of My Fair Lady in 1964. As for O'Toole, he had fewer film credits, but he had a couple of big ones. T.E. Lawrence in Lawrence of Arabia and Henry II in Beckett. These two were guaranteed to get butts in the seats. The director was William Wyler, who had won three Oscars for directing before taking the helm of How to Steal a Million. He had directed Hepburn to that Oscar for Roman Holiday, so the two had an instant connection in this art caper comedy. As I had mentioned in previous episodes, John Williams was doing very well as a composer for popular TV shows such as Gilligan's Island and Lost in Space. Erwin Allen, the creator of Lost in Space, asked Williams to work on the TV show The Time Tunnel in 1966, and Williams created this theme. Williams wasn't the first choice to write music for How to Steal a Million. Nelson Riddle, who had just written the score to the Audrey Hepburn film Paris When It Sizzles, was William Wyler's first choice. But, at the time Wyler needed his composer to start writing music, Riddle was already working on the TV version of Batman, which was set to hit TV screens at the same time. Oddly enough, Riddle's remaining career in film scoring came mostly from working with Frank Sinatra and his Rat Pack films. You might remember that John Williams was the composer for Sinatra's only directorial effort, None But the Brave. How lucky for us that Riddle took over as Sinatra's composer of choice and that Riddle was too busy to serve as composer for How to Steal a Million. 
John Williams has regarded his work on How to Steal a Million as a new chapter in his film music career. Though the music itself is quite good, it's what happened behind the scenes that made Williams' film like feel like he was taking a major step forward. This was the first score in which he would serve as music producer, and the album release of the score, which I'll talk about later, was the first time he got credit as producer. He would serve as producer on pretty much every commercial release of his music after that, thereby having creative control over how the music is presented and distributed. All right, so let's get to a brief description of the movie with the warning that there are upcoming spoilers. Hepburn plays Nicole Bonnet, the daughter of an art forger in Paris who has just sold a fake painting by Cezanne for a lot of money. The film centers on a statue of Venus that is being loaned to a Paris museum. The statue, which Nicole and her father owned, is a fake, having been sculpted by Nicole's grandfather and modeled after her grandmother. Everyone else believes that the statue is at least four years, 400 years old and priceless. In order to keep an art examiner from discovering the forgery, Nicole enlists the help of a British man named Simon to help her steal the statue, collect the million-dollar insurance, and keep her father from going to jail. Pretty much the second half of the movie deals with the theft of the statue, the ensuing getaway, and the cover-up. We find out that Simon is actually a forgery detective and is only taking part in the robbery because... He's fallen in love with Nicole. This isn't so much a laugh-out-loud comedy as it is just a movie that makes you feel good. Of course, Nicole and Simon are movie star cued, and we know longer, long before it actually happens that they will fall in love and ride off into the Parisian sunset together. And with a wonderfully sprite theme by John Williams, we actually kind of like these art thieves. Williams' sole theme for the film is pretty much a jack-of-all-trade. It's a general theme for the film a love theme, a hotel lounge number, and a musical anchor for screwball comedy. How many composers can write a melody that can do all that? Remember that main theme in I Passed for White so many years ago and how it started out as sorrowful but becomes triumphant at the end? Most of that depends on the instrumentation, but a lot of it on how the melody is composed. So let's listen to that main theme now as written for the opening credits. About 10 minutes into the film, the Venus statue is transported from the Bonnet home by armored truck with what seems like half the French army as escorts. Listen to the semi-comedic march Williams writes for the scene in which the box containing the statue is put in the truck. A few minutes later, we see the armored truck on the streets of Paris, with Parisians stopping to watch the truck go by. 
there's a brief performance of Les Marseillaise, the French national anthem. Then an organ comes in as we see two priests paying homage to the passing truck. Now we get to the heart of the music for How to Steal a Million. There's a lot of sneaking around in this film, and Williams scores it with a lot of tinkling piano on the high end of the scale. We're introduced to this as Simon sneaks into the Bonnet house to get a sample of a fake Van Gogh painting to prove the forgery. Nicole is the only one at home, and she hears Simon downstairs. John Williams is pretty good at reading a scene musically, and it's great in this instance. Tinkling Piano adds some color to the music, just enough to be noticed, but not overpower the music. So, Nicole picks up an antique, antique gun and is ready to surprise Simon. The music rises in intensity, then ends when she turns on the light. Simon manages to sweet talk Nicole into not shooting him, but she accidentally does when she puts the gun down on the table. Listen to the orchestra go crazy as Simon falls to the ground and Nicole runs away. Simon reaches into his shirt and shows Nicole some blood. Simon faints to the ground and so does Nicole. Now you don't need to see this happen because the orchestra performs it so well musically. Nicole feels bad about shooting Simon, and since he is in no condition to drive, she takes him back to his hotel. As a sign of thanks, he kisses her. Our main theme is played as they kiss, and while Nicole contemplates the kiss on the taxi ride home. <laughs> Thirty-eight Rue Parmenté. Drive carefully. Get a good night's sleep.
When I first saw this movie about 15 years ago, there were two scenes that I never forgot. And we're going to talk about the first one right now. It happens after Nicole's father signs an insurance contract for the statue totaling $1 million. But in order for the insurance to kick in, there must be a technical examination of the statue to make sure it's authentic. Knowing they are ruined if the statue is discovered to be fake, Nicole and her father react in subdued shock. That reaction is accompanied very simply in musical terms with a timpani drum. Technical examination. After the museum representative leaves the house, Nicole and her father each collapse into two chairs in the hallway. A bassoon is there to musically signify them slinking into their chairs. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, um, good day. Uh, Wait. Uh, Almost 15 years later, and I remember that scene so well. And I got a chill when I heard the music again. It's so great hearing John Williams have a lot of fun writing music to fit that scene, emphasize the comedy without going overboard, and generate a little laugh with it. Without that music, the scene would have just been okay. John Williams does very well with writing source music. Now, as a reminder, that's music that's heard by the characters in the movie. It could sometimes be previously written music, a song, or music the film's composer writes before filming. The source music for How to Steal a Million is played in a hotel lounge where Nicole is meeting Simon to ask him help steal the statue. Williams takes a variation of the main theme and plays it on piano. Instinctively, you believe this music is being played off screen by a piano player because, well, it's a hotel lounge, and hotel lounges usually have piano players. But it was composed long after the scene was filmed, but beautifully written to blend in very well. After Simon agrees to take on the job of stealing the statue, he and Nicole go to the museum to do what's called casing the joint. As they examine the guards, the security system, and the surroundings, John Williams brings back the tinkling piano with cello and flutes joining in.
20 film minutes later, we're back in the museum as Simon and Nicole are getting ready to perform the heist. As museum visitors leave, Nicole and Simon hide in a fireplace until the guards leave the museum floor. Once the coast is clear, the two move to a small broom closet. And once again, the music is perfectly performed, and Williams does well as conductor to keep the orchestra subdued, including the trombones you hear. The music ends as they enter the broom closet, but I think Williams should have written music that lasted another minute or two, and it would have segued wonderfully into a very brief musical cue that lets the brass section have a bit of fun as we see various film as we see various shots of paintings in the museum. And then a shot of Nicole and Simon still waiting in the broom closet. So, now we're at the second scene of the film that I remembered after watching it the first time all those years ago. It's a scene when Simon is trying to get a key from a hook outside the broom closet so he can unlock the door from the inside. Watching it again, this reminded me of the scene in Bachelor Flat when Jessica the dog is dragging a big bone to the beach and burying it. John Williams wrote a fun mambo piece for that scene, and here... He composes a fun little jazzy piece that includes an electronic keyboard, his first foray into electronic music. Another thing that's great about the scene is that there's no dialogue. It's plenty of opportunity to let John Williams' music shine. Now, this music doesn't fit in with the rest of the score, and in a way, that's why it stands out so well. It just It's so memorable, and it just sticks in your brain long after that scene is over. <laughs> When Simon is able to finally take the statue, John Williams comes back to the piano. This is the most piano writing I think John Williams has done for a film score up to this point, something that probably made him happy as a classically trained pianist. I would have loved to have seen his process writing these tinkling piano notes as he's working out the right notes to play and going through different variations. Oh. 
Once the guards discover the statue has been replaced by a wine bottle, all hell breaks loose on screen and in the orchestra. John Williams employs the concertina, a relative of the accordion, at the beginning of the scene, then uses the main theme on the concertina as the guards scurry about the museum. There's a Keystone Cops feel to the scene, especially when a guard slips on a wet floor. A trombone scores that moment. I'm surprised that John Williams and his orchestrator James Harbert waited so long to use the concertina in this score. Its sound is definitely associated with Paris, so to exclude it from the score in a movie that takes place in Paris is either a smart decision or a dumb one. Personally, I think it's smart, because by discarding the cliches, Williams is able to be a little freer with the score here and not restricted to what sounds good on the concertina. What also stands out for this score is its lack of a major theme for the statue. I had fully expected Williams to compose a brief melody for the Venus statue since it figures so prominently in the plot. Not having such a theme doesn't diminish the score for me, but it it illustrates what I think is a missed opportunity for Williams to show how capable he is as a composer. Remember that his good friend and mentor, Henry Mancini, wrote a very popular theme for the movie The Pink Panther a few er years earlier, And that was music written for a diamond. So anyway, this is a great score for Williams. I wouldn't mark it as a turning point musically for him, since I don't sense that it sounds different from anything else he had done before it. But this was the first big hit movie that John Williams had done. And for that, it definitely is a step forward. And it's only going to get better. Three of the four films that he will do next feature big movie stars and prominent directors showing that John Williams was no longer a second-class composer in the Hollywood hierarchy. As I mentioned earlier, the score got an album release, but it was music that was re-recorded by a studio orchestra with Williams redoing some of his music. I'm not sure why the original music could not have been used, and if you hear the re-recording of the score, things tend to sound a bit different. The music for the scene where the guards run through the museum after the statue is stolen features different instruments entirely. Most of the rest of the music has different orchestrations as well, or played just different enough to be noticed. There was a CD released in 2008 featuring the original music, though the distributor did not print many copies, and it has since become a collector's item. Well, that was a fun look at the film How to Steal a Million. But we're not done with 1966 yet. In our next episode, we'll go back to the Western genre as John Williams writes music for a remake before wrapping up the busy year with two more comedies. Again, a big thanks to you all for listening to this podcast. I would love to hear from you, so please send your comments to me via email at jeffswim at aol.com or via Twitter at jeffswim. I might read your comments on a future show. 
Until next time, everybody, the baton is down.